Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, we're kicking off a month-long, action-packed thrill ride of geospatial content. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in. It's a beautiful day here where I am, and I hope it is for you as well. And I also hope that you're doing well in these crazy days and staying safe and still able to do your good work. So today, I'll be talking about markets of mobility and other stuff. Um, what's a market of mobility? Well, we'll find out. Let's dive right in. Uh, but first of all, uh, I'll just introduce myself to you, tell you who I am. My name is John Nelson. I work for a software company called Esri, and we make geographic information system software for, the, uh, for all kinds of systems and platforms. Um, I specifically work on the content team, uh, in particular for the Living Atlas. I do a lot of work with the Living Atlas, uh, using its data, promoting the fact that it exists and it's loaded with good stuff for everybody to use. Um, and I also do a lot of cartography here at Esri, making maps, and then uh, I will write about the process of making those maps, and I'll give you resources for how to make maps like that, and I'll share my lessons learned so that we can all be making maps together and learn new things together. I also design user experiences for some of our applications, particularly for the Living Atlas, so there's always lots of fun to be had. You don't need to hear me say that when it comes to the geospatial world. There's all kinds of cool things to learn and discover, always something new. Um, you can find some of my work and writings at my blog, adventuresinmapping.com. I also blog even more frequently at Esri's blog platform, the ArcGIS blog, and there's a link there to that. And I'll repeat this slide at the end of the presentation too, if you miss it. Um, I tweet a lot about things that I'm working on as I'm working on them, so check that out. And I also have started a YouTube channel this past year where I do a lot of how-to mapping. So a whole bunch of one minute long snippets about how to do something very specific that maybe you can kind of compile into something useful. Or I'll do some series of longer form videos taking a map from start to finish and kind of walking through the process of how to do that. And you can always find me on LinkedIn. Anything I do, I'll spam it into LinkedIn and you can, you can find it there. So please feel free to connect with me there or on any of those other channels. By the way, my daughter Willow, who just turned 13 during this lockdown, designed that logo for me. Very official, beautiful little charming logo. Thank you very much, Willow. We call her a quarantine-ager. Okay, so I'm going to dive right into... Uh, a demo, but maybe not a demo that you would naturally expect. So let's fire up a browser. And I'm going to do a search for NASA, fi oh, yeah, there we go, NASA fire data. Active fires on the surface of the planet Earth. Active fire data. I love you, NASA, so much. So if you uh, scroll down here, they have an option for downloading this data. Now, at any time, there are two satellites whizzing around the Earth, collecting information about the surface of the Earth, taking imagery, but there's also a thermal sensor on board that can detect what they call thermal anomalies, which means hot spots or places that are hotter and brighter than normal. And they feed that beta data back down to Earth, and the robots and maybe some humans take a look at it and go, well, we're pretty sure this is actually a fire versus, you know, we're not that sure it's a fire. And you can download this and check it out for yourself. So I'm going to download some text files. And I'll choose entire world coverage for the last seven days, let's say. I'll install this or download this. <clears throat> Oops, that was... Ah, text files. Okay, I don't want a shape file. I take it back. So I'm downloading a text file. It's just a simple CSV, and I'm going to open it in Microsoft Excel. So for the whole world, the past seven days, boom, it's downloaded. Uh, my default application for CSV files is Microsoft Excel. That's fine. Let's fire this up and see what we've got. So I'm going to select this corner cell and double-click one of these dividers so that we can read everything. And it's, it's really pretty interesting. I mean, first and foremost, my eyeballs noticed the latitude and longitude cells. Um, but 
but there's also brightness, some scan and track information about the position of the satellite, its date of acquisition over this last week, uh, this rolling one-week window, what time it was acquired, which satellite acquired it. There's a couple satellites, like I said, so they don't have uh, a gap in coverage, A and T, and how confident the robots are that this is actually a fire and not something uh, just reflected off of a hot roof or something like that. Okay, and then we've got something pretty interesting here called FRP, and I had to look this up. This stands for Fire Radiative Power, and really it's the amount of energy released in that one by one kilometer cell on the surface of the Earth. How much fire energy is being released at that location? And that's pretty interesting. And then lastly, we have day versus night. So I'll grab all of these columns, and I'm going to create what's called a pivot table. And if you work with data, you're probably aware of what a pivot table is. If you're not, check out pivot tables because they're pretty fantastic. Um, you're not stuck with the tyranny of rows and columns as it's delivered to you in a simple table. You can say, well, let me slice the, and dice the data different ways. And uh, the software is happy to show you aggregations of that data and however you want to contort it. So for example, I can say, well, let's uh, choose which satellite it was that detected the fire. We'll drag that into rows. That's now our row configuration. And then let's see if it was nighttime or day. And we'll put that for columns. And then we'll drag fire radiative power for the actual values of the cells. Simple. That's it. I've just created a pivot table. I've kind of stepped outside of the world of rows and columns as it's delivered to me. And the computer is doing all this aggregation work so I can define my own rows and columns. And if I look at this, I'm seeing four numbers. Uh, satellite A, satellite T, was it day versus night? And I mean, some of these numbers are bigger than others, but numbers are abstractions. They're something that we've invented to communicate uh, the magnitude or the quantity of something. And our brain doesn't inherently look at a number, and especially big numbers like this, and intrinsically have a sense for how big that is. We have a really hard time with that. Numbers are great, but they're abstractions. And something that data viz people particularly map makers like to do is encode other visual variables in the communication of this data. So I'll do that right now. I will go to the home tab and I'll say, let's do some conditional formatting and I'll choose color scales that look like this. Now, immediately I have a sense for more, medium, and then less, right? Because we're taking advantage of the way that our brains are wired and we're communicating something a lot more visually through color. So let's get rid of this pivot table. I'll delete it. Now I'll go back and take a look at this. Now, this is pretty interesting. A geographer like me looks at something like this and goes, okay, latitude and longitude. This is empowered. We're working with a totally different dimension than, than typical numbers. And so what I'm gonna do is just create a rounded version of these guys. I'll say uh, equals, round to make a generalized version i'll round it to the nearest coordinate or ordinate of latitude zero degrees of precision so there we go and then i'll say equals round to the nearest ordinate of longitude zero and now I've rounded to the nearest lat long cell or line. And I'm just going to flood fill this all the way down. I'll call this lat short. I'll ironically call this long short, just so I can differentiate it visually between you know the, the original full resolution source data. Lat short and long, or lat short and long short. Now, remember what I said about confidence? And there's a whole lot of discussion recently about how to map fire data, especially with the, the horrible wildfire season that happened in Australia and people were trying to represent this. And uh, they were taking this data, but they were also mapping the very low confidence instances of fire. So maybe there's something we can do about that. We'll clean up this data and we'll say, let's add some filters. And I'm only going to retain 
really confident stuff. So uh, 95% plus confidence that it's actually a fire. And that reduces my data a fair bit. Okay, now let's make a pivot table. So I'm gonna insert a pivot table. I'll come here and I mean, we're map nerds. So we all know that latitude is just an encoding of how far up and down we are on the surface of our planet, our north-southiness. Latitude is north-southiness. Change in latitude, change in attitude. That's how I remember it. And I'll drag latitude short and make it my rows because what's a row? It's just a representation for how up or down something is. Now, the way that latitude works is we have negative at the bottom and it goes to positive, which is zero at the equator, and then positive at the North Pole. So I'm just going to reverse this default sort so that large numbers are at the top, smaller to negative numbers are at the bottom. Then I will grab my longitude, which has been shortened, and stick this in my columns area because what's longitude? Longitude is nothing more than east west, east westiness. You know, where am I? around the surface of the earth. And that's the same thing as a column, really, if we're thinking Cartesian coordinates wise, that's a column. And lastly, let's drag our fire radiative power in here now and pop that in there. We'll give these guys a roughly square dimension. And I'm gonna zoom out. And you should be seeing something that looks somewhat familiar as I zoom and pan across these cells. What are we looking at right now? Don't everybody all shout this out at once, right? What are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a map of the world with aggregated fire intensity over the past one week beamed down to us via robots flying in space and visualized as a pivot table in Microsoft Excel. This is insane, this is bananas. You're not supposed to do this. This is not what Microsoft Excel was built to do. Furthermore, let's take this data. And as I was saying about map nerds loving to break out the crayons and color in, let's do some conditional formatting here. We'll do colored scales once more, but this time let's do the lowest 10 percentile as this kind of deep, dark, cool blue. Actually, we'll do three scales. It'll be more interesting. And then middle range fires will be red. And then the highest 10 percentile will be this bright, hot yellow. This looks like a nice fire gradient. Good enough for us. Hit OK. We'll give these backgrounds some black cells. And now we've got essentially a choropleth aggregation of fires across the world over the last week in Microsoft Excel. This is insane, right? Let's take it. No. Look at this. It's, an, it, it's impossible, but it's totally possible. These are just numbers. They're just color-coded cells, aggregated, um, but it becomes a map when the human eyeball looks at this and we filter it through our sense of history in our context. And we're aware of the fact that, yes, this is representing a geographic phenomenon. And I'm looking at a map. It becomes a map when I see it. So let's close out of here. Get rid of that. Thank you, NASA. Uh, why did I just show you this? Well, I showed it to you because I think it's important for uh, people who are kind of swimming in technology every day, wading around in tools and applications and data to remember that those tools and applications exist just so that you can do your job and you can effectively communicate a phenomenon from its uh, abstract form into something more tangible for human beings to look at and understand. And those tools are not the boss of you. You know, Microsoft Excel is not invented to make a map, but we know about latitude and longitude and we're curious folks. And so we can kind of squeeze a map out of Microsoft Excel. Imagine if there were tools that were intended to make maps, right? How much we could do. So don't be intimidated by software and technology. You're the boss. You tell it what to do. 
and make it do what you want it to do. And please, please misuse technology, misuse these tools, use them in ways that they were not designed to support because there's so much interesting things that can happen when you start flipping things on their head. Secondly, uh, like I said, a spatial product only really becomes a map when the mind looks at it and understands it as such. You take that information and then you apply your history and your knowledge to it, and then you come up with a next step. But it's only a map when it's perceived as a map inside your head. Until then, it's just data and it's just raw information waiting for you to consume it. And lastly, of course, geography is different. I was able to make a map in Microsoft Excel because a latitude and a longitude value are different than any other numeric data types. They're not just another number, right? It's this whole format of thinking, this whole spatial dimension that you can fall into, uh, like falling through the mirror, right? Geography is different than the, those other data types, and we know this, and you can take full advantage of that. So speaking of geography and latitude, longitude coordinates, uh, gosh, a couple months ago now, I saw via the Living Atlas that Definitive Healthcare had shared uh, outright freely, which is very generous of them, their counts of hospital beds in American hospitals when this was all starting to roll out and people were looking at hospital beds essentially as the currency of the coronavirus response. How are we going to respond to this? Well, first of all, we need to know how many hospital beds we have and where they are. And I just uh, looked at this today. So this is available in the Living Atlas. If you if you search for USA hospital beds or hospital beds or definitive healthcare, you'll see. And you'll also see that it's a very um, popular feed. So this view count is well over a million, and it's not that old. And if you look at the updated date, that's today, May the 4th, be with you. This is May 4th. This is updated every day with new and ongoing data as they're taking a look at the situation and updating this, which is really just a fantastic resource. So I was uh, looking at this and I think, okay, well, I'm in Michigan and I live near Lansing. What hospitals are near me? How many hospital beds do they have? And that's interesting, but it's um, when data is in a format like this, in its raw point and quantity format, um, you can do some things, but it takes an effort. What I want to do is think in my area, how many people live in the same area as me and how many hospital beds do we have access to? Once this starts really getting rocking and rolling, really it's the rate of hospital beds to the underlying population that's really important because ultimately the count of hospital beds, beds is indistinguishable from raw population, from total population here, right? So you want to tease out the relationship and see if there are areas that have a higher per capita representation of hospital beds or lower representation of hospital beds. And so what that means is I had to aggregate these into areas. Now the question is, well, what area do I aggregate into? I like using the hexagon as an aggregation unit. It's, uh, it's my favorite shape. And it's the favorite shape of many geographers because it's the most geometrically complex shape that still retains geographic compactness. So it's this beautiful irony of complexity and compactness. And if you can aggregate data into this, you can kind of free yourself from the somewhat arbitrary and weird um, borders of political boundaries, right? And I was looking at this and I was sharing it with Esri's chief medical officer, kind of consulting with them as I was trying to understand this data and come up with maps that could be used and, and useful to people. And their feedback was, well, this is really interesting, but I can see Chicago and Detroit, New York, Washington, LA, they have lots of hospital beds. And that's interesting. And we can do a rate, but is there a way to come up with a more equitable distribution of these hospital beds, it's more practical and pragmatic. And I thought, oh gosh, yeah, okay. Let me let me take a step back. And ultimately, what I went with was a county-based aggregation. And my knee-jerk reaction is, first of all, my knee-jerk reaction is to aggregate into counties because they're there 
They're easy. We've got loads of demographic and historical data at the county level. And then my second knee-jerk reaction is to respond to that and say, no, Nelson, don't aggregate to the county. You don't want to be uh, beholden to the arbitrary physical borders of these political areas and their perfect squares and their weird inconsistent areas and that kind of thing. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I came back around and I said, no, actually, in this instance, local units of government are going to be very important to the coronavirus response in treating people with COVID-19. And what's more is people who live in, say, Eaton County, Michigan, which is where I live, they know what county they live in. They wouldn't know what arbitrary um, geometric hexagon they happened to fall within that some GIS nerd had, had created, thrown a fishnet over the United States. I know I live in Eaton County, and I can conceptualize that. And there's an emotional um, currency that takes hold when I realize that this is me, this is where I live, and I can recognize that on a map. And I'll show you the results of this, which was um, put into uh, an Esri story map. So story maps are these uh, simple, powerful, and very capable um, set of tools that you can push your maps into and wrap a narrative around them. And so here was the result of that. So we've got our hospital locations. They're essentially a de facto population map. And if we take a look at counties and then create a rate of hospital beds per person, then we've got something that's actually a lot more meaningful. And you can see my legend here is uh, keying the color that I've used here in the map instead of a, a standard math problem, this color equals that, this color equals that, I'm trying to help reinforce the fact that if you're one person, how many, or if you're one hospital bed, how many people might need one hospital bed in your county? Is it uh, less than 100 people per hospital bed, or is it more than 750 people per hospital bed? And there's a really a tremendous range. And then I kind of walked through this as I do in a story map format. Um, one of the beauties of a story map is you don't have to lob a complex visualization product over the fence and then cross your fingers and hope that people get it, hope that they read your legend. You're in control of the narrative and you reveal the data as people walk through this. And you can say, this is how, you know, this, these are the locations where there's actually a lot of people per hospital bed. You know, maybe we should take a look at this. And ultimately, you can do some comparisons too. So I can compare the prevalence of hospital beds to the average age of a location because we know that there's some um, pretty serious comorbidities involved with coronavirus and COVID-19. So we can look at age and get a sense for where the vulnerable population is in regards to our areas with kind of a, a, a dangerous uh, people to hospital bed ratio. We can look at the average health of a place, you know, how healthy or unhealthy is a place, and take a look at that in the context of our um, vulnerable population. And then and lastly, in this example, I looked at food security because uh, uh, in, a, in a shutdown scenario, getting access to food is even more difficult than usual, usual, as we all know. In some places, it's already very difficult. And these are the most vulnerable populations already. So taking a look at Food security in the context of vulnerable populations for low ratio hospital beds. These are all very interesting things. And I was quick to share that on the internet as I want to do. So I, I, I tweeted out this and said, hey, check out this hospital bed, you know, per capita story map that I'd made. I made the data publicly available, which you can find too. It's publicly available for everybody. And I knew it, I, I, was, I was confident. Right away, Alex Hill, who's actually a, a GIS and transportation expert at Wayne State University here in Michigan, saw this and said, oh, that's great. But maybe you should have used your Craigslist regions for that. And I was like, yes, I know, I thought of the Craigslist regions, but then I didn't do it because I wanted to go with county. But there's a really interesting case for Craigslist regions and using Craigslist uh, economic zones to aggregate this sort of data. And I did it, you know, the, the process is actually quite fast and short. I shared that publicly and shared that with Alex. Um, and I'm gonna share with you how to do that. 
and some more background into what exactly a Craigslist zone is. So if you're interested in seeing the aggregation of hospital beds a month and a half ago, aggregated into Craigslist regions, then here is a link to that data set, which you can download directly. And frankly, you can recalculate that uh, reallocation of hospital beds with the fresh version of the hospital bed counts per hospital. And I'll show you how to do that as well. So let's take a look. Um, you're probably wondering what a Craigslist zone even is. Well, a Craigslist zone takes seed locations from all of the craigslist.org sites and just grows a territory around them. So uh, if you're not familiar with Craigslist, it's just this uh, very basic but very broad and powerful website where somebody can buy or sell something and presumably their neighborhood will be able to see that and you can uh, make a, an economic exchange. You can, you know, I'm going to sell my toaster and I'm going to list it on Craigslist or I have an apartment to rent in this neighborhood. I'm going to list it on Craigslist and people in that neighborhood go to Craigslist and they're redirected to a geographically specific version of Craigslist and they can see what's for sale in their area. So it's a very geographically aware um, system uh, for a, a free market buying and, and selling exchange of stuff. And what's nice about Craigslist zones is they're rather contiguous. You know, there's no gaps, or if there is gaps based on your technique, they're, they're relatively minor. And they're geographically compact. You know, have islands uh, of a Craigslist site floating around. And they're very useful, practical economic zones to understand where people are willing to travel to make an economic exchange. And frankly, that's a really valuable thing to visualize and use in your own analysis of uh, market transactions. Even if you're just advertising and you want to hit uh, something very specific geographically, you can use these. Um, they're also a good proxy for how far somebody is willing to travel um, to make these self-selected economic transactions. And they aren't beholden to political borders, which is really interesting. They aren't this perfect grid that was determined by people 2,000 miles away in Washington, D.C. in the mid-1800s, you know, um, you're actually looking at something that's living and growing and, and merged based on actual data that's happening in the real world right now. And they're a good alternative often to zip code areas. Zip codes are weird, friends. Um, they aren't necessarily intended to be areas. The post office uses them to deliver mail, and really they're a collection of physical address points, and they have a shared zip code ID. The fact that we um, find that very useful and then convert that into an area is breaking the rules a little bit for what a zip code really is, but gosh, they're just so useful that we have to create areas out of them. So I'll circle back to that later. Uh, these are a good alternative to zip codes, potentially given your use case. Um, and they're just ready to have data put into them. They're really good buckets because they're just simple polygons and they're ready for you to enrich that with demographic or income or who knows what. So how do you make them? Well, uh, the process, uh, I'll step through it. So if you go to craigslist.org about and then their site locations, uh, Craigslist has hundreds and hundreds of local versions of itself, little windows into a local economic community for a place. And they have a system that when I go to craigslist.org, it recognizes my IP address of my browser and goes, oh, you know, Nelson's going to go to the Lansing area. And we wondered like, well, what's behind the scenes? What's pushing me to, how does it know my IP address is interested in buying toasters from the Lansing area, right? So there's some behind the scenes magic happening to redirect me to an actual geography. And um, I don't know what that is. You know, we don't have access to that algorithm. That's that's behind the, the black box, that's up to Craigslist. And so we can kind of try to tease out what that might be. And so if I take a look at all these and I just copy them, paste them into Excel, save it as a CSV, do some special formatting, um, maybe I can make something a little bit like a Voronoi diagram. Now, a Voronoi diagram, if you're a mathematician, you know, you call it a Voronoi diagram. It's really just 
growing regions out of seed locations, like, you know, student houses, house locations, and then maybe we'll grow a Voronoi area around them to determine the bus pickup zones, that kind of thing, or school districts, or, you know, who knows what. Uh, GIS, people like to call them Thiessen polygons because somebody named Thiessen kind of used this to come up with uh, geographically based polygons. And I used the simple Voronoi method to create this United States of Craigslist map. You know, I called it the United States of Craigslist at the time. And here they are. These are the guest at geographic zones associated with each Craigslist named site. All right, that's cool. How do we, why did I make it look like a chalkboard? I don't know. For a while, I just liked making maps that look like they were made out of chalkboard. If something's interesting looking, more people are going to uh, be interested in looking at it. So there is some currency in making visually interesting things. Now, this wouldn't be a GIS slash geography presentation if I didn't roll out the old John Snow map, you know, tried and true content for any kind of geography talk. Well, John Snow, um, in addition to essentially inventing epidemiology with this map and his efforts around the, um, the outbreak of uh, this disease in London, what, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, um, cholera. So there was a cholera outbreak in London, and he suspected it was the pumps causing the problem. Back then, everybody thought it was bad air. Miasma was the prevailing philosophy of the day, like, you know, don't breathe the air because it's got the disease in it. They didn't really understand um, microscopic uh, biology. And he said, no, it's probably the pumps. And he, he really helped make his case by showing geographically in this picture, the location of uh, cholera deaths put specifically you know, in front of each house where they lived. So really like a, an emotionally impactful, visceral visualization of the, the problem of cholera in this outbreak. But he also mapped, coincidentally, the pump locations. Now, what isn't talked about a whole lot is the fact that Jon Snow also used a sort of Thiessen polygon or Voronoi tessellation of these pumps. Um, which is he would draw on top of this map a region serve that each that each pump serves, all the city blocks that each of these pumps would serve. And he did that actually by physically walking from pump to pump, keeping track of how far he was going, how many paces, and then creating a midpoint to distinguish, well, if I live in this house, I'm probably going to go to pump A. If I live you know, one step over, I'm going to go to pump B because it's closer. So he's creating this decent like Voronoi-like tessellation to help prove his case that people frequenting a specific pump were at higher risk if it was contaminated. Now, there's actually one little uh, block here where there were exactly zero deaths. Now, I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to go off on a little tangent and take a closer look at this. If we zoom in on this map of zero deaths, we see, okay, this is the brewery. This is a local brewer and zero people died here. And it turns out the reason for this was they have their own well. It's a very deep well, and it was free of contamination, cholera disease. And they also, as employees of the brewery, were allocated a specific amount of beer. You know, they, they were rationed beer as a form of their payment for themselves and their family. Little kids drinking beer. And guess what? Nobody died in that area. So, uh, little thing here. Beer saves the day. One more time. Thank you, beer. Okay, getting back to real life. We've got this um, tessellation of the United States based on a very simple, very basic geometric Voronoi chopping up of the United States. And you can see these lines are impossibly clean, impossibly smooth, and that's okay. But I know that there's, you know, this would work for as the bird flies kinds of things with no physical barriers. But we live in a place where you have to get into a car and drive on roads and go from one place to another. And we know that there's a lot of twisting and turning and there's a lot of variability uh, in the drive time between these places. We're not strapping on wings and flying to this location. So there's a lot more complexity that we can add into this model. And I was like, well, how can we 
how can we do a, a Jon Snow like justice to this sort of map? And I was well, he did he did some walking. You know, I looked at my map and it was too smooth, it was too perfect, the boundaries were too straight. You know, we live in a real world where there's friction from A to B. And uh, frankly, it kind of reminded me of, as many things do, my niece Cadence's seminal map of two, or a geography quiz of 2013, where she defined a map. What is a map? Well, it's this. And in my case, I kind of agreed with Cadence. Maybe I can do better. And so instead of the impossible Thiessen polygon algorithm, or Voronoi, I did drive times. It's pretty straightforward, right? Instead of growing out an impossibly geometrically even surface, we can use uh, the algorithm that takes actual road networks and sees how far I can drive in any given amount of time, blast that drive time window out to, in this example, five hours, and then just stop where they meet each other. We're growing territories and we're stopping where they meet each other, but it's informed by the underlying transportation network. And each of these polygons has to do with a named place in our list of Craigslist sites. So we're really getting somewhere. Let's see how to do this. Okay, so we take that list of Craigslist sites, and if you'll notice, there's a couple odd things about this list. There are places that have multiple locations that serve a single Craigslist URL, like Tyler and East Texas, or Reno and Tahoe, or South Bend and Michania, or Huntsville and Decatur, Florence, Alabama, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. They all share the same Craigslist site. Um, and there's also some very vaguely named things like Southeast Iowa. You know, how do I put a pin in Southeast Iowa? I got to put a pin somewhere. Where is it going to go? And so there's a bit of manual work that goes into this. And the result was this. You know, it was every place that had a, uh, multiple locations named in its name, like Florence and Muscle Shoal, Shoals. I'll split that out into two and say I'm going to geocode Florence and I'm going to geocode Muscle Shoals. And for those oddly named, really vague places like Southeast Iowa, I just dropped a pin and it was informed a bit as much as possible by the map that Craigslist themselves provides. You know, they have a little pin that sits somewhere. So that helped out that process a bit. And the result was a CSV table, which I dropped into ArcGIS online and said, this is my states, these are my cities, let's go, let's geocode it. And the result is pretty quick. We've got 461 named locations geocoded as points on a map having to do with Craigslist site locations. But right now, Similar to our hospital problem, we've just got hospital points. And right now we've just got city points. We want to grow out an area around those points. And so I ran an analysis for drive time for all, you know, 400 plus and said, give me a five hour drive time. And if they meet each other, just stop right there. And sometime later, this was my result. Again, this is ArcGIS online. Now, if you'll notice um, these areas, spill over into parts of Canada and Mexico. And um, if you've ever driven across the border between you know, the United States and Canada or vice versa, the United States and Mexico or vice versa, that's an impediment to travel. I'm not going to buy a toaster on the other side of the border and you know go uh, through all the hassle of a border uh, crossing just to get my toaster. So it's a simple process of... Well, actually, let's back up. Um, first, I'm going to geographically dissolve all of those double named places. Like Florence has an area and Muscle Shoals has an area, but it's Craigslist URL is Florence Muscle Shoals. So I just do a simple dissolve based on its Craigslist URL. And then I've got the real shapes for these areas. right? And I've kind of marked in red here the places where I've knocked down the border between these uh, same named Craigslist zones. And then I can pull in a shape of the United States and just do a simple cookie cutter operation. I'm gonna do an intersection of these Craigslist zones to the shape of the United States and then get a clean United States only geographic um, cookie cutter of Craigslist zones. These are Craigslist zones and they're polygons and they're ready for us to just heap our data into.
So let's do that. Um, here is how I added the hospital data. So in ArcGIS Online, I just did a search within the Living Atlas um, itself there at the top. You can add data and say search the Living Atlas for data. And I added in the definitive healthcare hospital beds and put it on the map here. And then it's a, a process of looking at this data and, and realizing there's a couple hospital types that are included in this that probably are not related to COVID-19 and the coronavirus response, right? One of them is psychiatric hospitals. It's a different kind of hospital, so I'm not going to count those beds in my aggregation. And another is religious non-medical hospitals. So I'll exclude those from my aggregation as well and pull in all the other hospital types, you know, like uh, acute care, long-term, short-term, VA hospitals, that sort of thing, the DOD hospitals. And if I do a summarize within aggregation, I can just say, add up all of the number of licensed hospital beds, all the number of staffed hospital beds, all the number of ICU specific hospital beds within each area, and just give me an attribute for each of those summed up. And that's the result. It's uh, quite straightforward. And in this example, it was useful to push out um, early on in the process to say, here are ad hoc kind of practical geographic locations that are used um, by the general public, uh, like a free market um, geographic distribution of economic zones in the United States. And here's how many hospital beds are within each. Now, in addition to this, you can start pulling in uh, like demographic information, like income or average age, like I had done earlier with counties, um, anything like that, anything that perhaps you have data about the vulnerability of the underlying population here, you can do uh, an enrichment process to say, show me those, uh, those populations within this geographic area, which doesn't line up with any kind of geographic area that the data was collected in, like counties and census tracts and census block groups and that kind of thing. There's some dark magic that goes into aggregating these up into uh, different geographic zones. Um, and now earlier on, I had kind of kicked around the whole notion of using zip codes for analysis, but um, I'm a practical person and I realized that zip codes are very important for a lot of applications. And they're so important that we see zip code areas used all the time in geographic applications when maybe a different geographic zone might be useful. But still, at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, you need to know where a zip code is. And so really, it's just a simple matter of um, doing a geographic summarize within of our Craigslist zones to say, well, just show me which zip codes comprise a Craigslist zone. So we've got all of the zip code areas for the United States, but they have a membership assigned to which Craigslist economic zone they fall within. And in this way, um, it's a little bit more useful to somebody. It's a little bit more pragmatic. You've got a list of zip codes. Maybe I can hit uh, via marketing or maybe via a public service announcement around uh, areas of self-selecting uh, economic mobility for the people who live in these areas. Um, what are you going to do with with Craigslist zones in, in this kind of world? Um, well, it helps you understand the local markets. These are areas where people are making physical transactions in person. That's especially interesting these days. And it's an exploration of what's really trade areas in what might become increasingly as time goes by, it appears, strained supply chains. So if you're trying to understand um, what's available and where is it available and how can it get from point A to point B, having a pragmatic, practical, kind of free market look at where these economic zones are might help you in, help inform some of your decisions. Um, and another thing that uh, decision makers are wrestling with right now, as you know, are balancing this concern of public health with the economy. When do we reopen the economy? At what point does waiting too long to reopen the economy start actually being a detriment to public health? And you get this kind of ironic feedback of reduced public health because of a prolonged uh, shutdown. What's the best timing for this? And I mean, 
nobody has the answer to this, but as economies and states consider reopening, they have a lot of things to balance in, in the scales for this sort of thing. And they're actually creating economic alliances with each other. And so this sort of geographic representation of the underlying areas of economic mobility for people can help inform perhaps these people who have to make economic alliances and give location or neighborhood specific advisories for when shelter in place uh, can be ended or re-implemented if there's uh, a spike in uh, new infections. Uh, how do you find these things? Everything I've showed you today is available. It's, um, it's man, if I make something, I'm going to share it. And if I have it, you can have it too. So anything related to these Craigslist polygons that um, you might be interested in trying out, just frankly, the easiest way is just to Google it. If you Google John Nelson Esri Craigslist, you're going to find a whole ream of URLs with things that I've shared. I've been uh, putzing around with Craigslist areas for a number of years now, over 10 years. And so the internet is stuffed with things that I've made having to do with Craigslist zones. So check that out, especially recently. I've, I've done some work recently this year with Craigslist zones, including the drive time. So you can have those, you can use them. You can follow the process that I use to make your own versions of them with your own parameters. Go nuts, you can have it. Um, and if you're interested in seeing some of the work around um, hospital beds and aggregating hospital bed counts within those Craigslist areas, or my story map about hospital beds in U.S. counties and what that looks like on a per capita basis. Just Google John Nelson Esri Hospital, and you'll find it. There's a there's a few uh, data products that I've made and a, and a handful of story maps that I've made as well around that. So give that a look if you're curious for more information or resources. Um, I also want to tell you that right now Esri is kicking off another instance of our cartography MOOC. So a MOOC is a massive online course. This is totally free. You can register. It actually started last week, <clears throat> but we're still taking registrations up to May 8th. So there's no problem registering now. I'm just jumping in and doing what you want. Um, it includes free access to all the software licenses for the duration of the course, including a grace period thereafter. Uh, so if you're interested in transitioning to ArcGIS Pro or interested in just maybe learning about Pro a little bit more or learning about cartography in general and, and interesting, effective ways of visualizing geographic data, check it out. It's totally free. You've got nothing to lose except your time on this allotted uh, planet that we live on. And it's it's been pretty popular. I mean, over 150,000 people uh, have have registered for this course over the times that it's been released. So join your map nerd buddies and take this free online course and, and uh, yeah, make fun, interesting maps. Uh, that's all I have for you today. If you're interested in seeing more of the stuff that uh, I put together, there's a link to my blog. Uh, there's a link to my Esri authored blogs and then some social media links that I invite you to peruse. Hey, John, just wanted to pop in real quick. If we got any Hi, questions Adam. in the chat room, uh, yeah. actually all the chat rooms uh, between Twitch or our Discord channel, everybody, this is the time to ask. They ask them live. Of course, you can leave those questions even after this video for John, and we'll make sure uh, John has a chance to respond to that even after the fact. Uh, so with that said, we'll stand for a couple minutes. I wanted to say that I watched the whole presentation. Pretty amazing. Honestly, I did not know you can do that much with Excel and uh and spreadsheets like you did. That, I don't that was, recommend uh, that was pretty it. I cool. don't recommend it, Adam. <laughs> you don't recommend it. Well, I, you know, I love messing with spreadsheets just because, you know, and you never know, you know, when you're in a disconnected environment, uh, especially when you're in the military, you don't know what kind of resources you may have available. You don't always have ArcGIS. You don't always have uh, Remote View, uh, Socket GXP. You don't have a GIS software all the time. Sometimes uh, you have a computer right in front of you and all you have is a spreadsheet and, uh, and you have to make the most of what you have. So That's true. And, um, and you know what? Everybody's got Excel, and it can be pretty intimidating to think, oh, a geographic information system, eh, what do I do? But if you're 
if you're interested in chatting with somebody and really breaking that seal of thinking about maps and thinking about geographic content, if you do that Excel demo for them, I think a lot of light bulbs go on over the heads like, okay, you know, it's not, it's not so crazy. You know, geography is special and I'm looking at something in Microsoft Excel. I mean, you could show your parents, you could show your kids that you can make a map in Microsoft Excel and they won't be as initially kind of apprehensive because you're firing up this big GIS, you know? So we do have one question that just popped up. Uh, the question is, can you use Arc Pro solely in a browser, for example, on Chromebooks? Um, ArcGIS Pro is a Windows application. There's not a, uh, oh, that's not, that's a Chromebook question. Um, yeah, ArcGIS Pro is a, is a desktop tool and ArcGIS Online is the web-based um, version of Ezra's GIS. So look up ArcGIS Online. So I guess I don't want to get too far down some of the Esri specific questions, but on the other hand, um, how much does Arc Pro in terms of the uh, features cross into ArcGIS Online just to help that that individual out a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly. I, I mean, I can't give you a, a specific percentage or even like an itemized list, although I'm sure an itemized list does exist somewhere and somebody could kind of compare the two. I do know that ArcGIS Online is always increasing in its capacity and its capabilities and getting you know closer and closer to parity with Pro, although there are things that it does not do that any kind of desktop application is just more suited for. But it's a very powerful online application and there are analysis tools that are available to you. Like I've shown you today, that was all done in ArcGIS online. And it's able to do it in the browser because it's reaching back to um, the algorithms and these powerful services in uh, the server environment, and then it serves up the results in your browser window. I think that helps because there's a lot of folks who have their powerful machines at work, you know, within their work environments, whether it be you're working the government or uh, at a corporate office. But as a lot of folks are now forced to work at home, uh, their machines are more, you know, uh, low end. They're not designed to handle that type of power and uh, more web based tools and applications that do uh, geospatial work. Is, is something that I think a lot of people are looking for. And I can tell you out there, beyond the resources that John has mentioned today, there are quite a few of them out there, you know, and uh, hopefully during this month, uh, whether it be myself or others, uh, we'll showcase some of those tools that help you work at home with geospatial uh, best practices. So I'm going to give you uh, 60 more seconds. And if anybody has any more questions, from the chat rooms, either in Twitch or our Discord servers, uh, uh, channels, uh, go ahead and ask now, and uh, we'll, we'll give John a chance to answer. We I have another the, person. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Adam. So we have another person in, in Twitch who uh, seemed to make a comment about zip codes aren't polygons, exclamation yeah, mark. So. Gonna, yep, that's what I was going to address. And they're totally right. Um, actually, uh, a, a bit of this was dedicated to the fact that zip codes aren't polygons and they're not necessarily intended for geographic aggregation or analysis. Um, they're just a collection of physical mailing address points. Um, but they there's a thing called the zip code tabulation area that exists because gosh, zip codes are just so handy. We've got to use them somehow geographically. And so um, my, my point there was that careful with zip codes, but I understand that zip codes are a very practical tool for people responding and, and applying their things geographically. And so I aggregated zip codes into those Craigslist areas. No, that makes a lot of sense, and and I understand why as well. You know, when when you're looking from a geographical boundaries type of thing, you got it only goes so far down, right? You got countries, you got states, you got, and then you get into the counties. What are what what geographic boundaries can you produce below counties? Yes, yeah, city boundaries maybe, but sometimes that's a little bit hiss or hit or miss whether uh, those actually exist and how far do those go out? And if you live outside those city areas. Within those larger counties, what do you have to divide that up more, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. I do not see any more questions from either chat rooms. So with that said, thank you for joining us, John, for Markets of Mobility and Other Sneaky Things here within the Geospatial Frontier Virtual Technology 
fair. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. All, everything that John mentioned, by the way, we're going to take this video, post it within the uh, post it within the conference page. Uh, I'll clean it up a little bit with the audio, and uh, you'll you'll get to see the After Effects within the uh, uh, within the next couple hours. So, uh, and all the links that John posted, I'm going to get that from him. We'll post it in the show notes too. Cool. So, thanks, Adam. Can you? Is there any way you can reduce the nasal quality of my voice? Speaking of edited audio. I'll see what I can do. Okay, I can work some you. miracles, but you know, others thank are, you. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. You're right. You sound pretty good, man. 